you might have seen we have started the, um, the recording of this uh, session. Um, we would like to uh, thank you all for being here and uh, remind you that, uh, of course, this chat session that is being recorded will also be uploaded to our website, um, to the website of the uh, law group of the University of Wageningen. And uh, right now you, you just see on screen our specialization in food law and regulatory affairs. Uh, if you are interested in our programs and in particular in this specialization, please feel free to get in touch with us and uh, uh, check out our website where you will find information about the specialization, um, our programs in food law in particular, but also um, other webinars uh, like the one that we are going to have today. Uh, in which experts in food law, environmental law, business and human rights, and so on, have contributed to, you know, animating the debate on some of the most uh, topical issues. And also follow us on our social media, uh, on Twitter and on LinkedIn, uh, the law group of the University of Wageningen. Um, so without further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to Mirta, who will... Uh, introduce uh, our uh, speaker today and then uh, we will uh, uh, start uh, today's webinar uh, that will last approximately one hour, one hour and a half. Mirta, you have the floor. Thank, Thank you, Chiara. And good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the seminar. Today we decided to, to, to share the uh, floor, uh, Chiara and I. And but just because I told Chiara that I was very happy to have Erika here, and so I thought about introducing her. So uh, welcome, Erika. So I'm very happy to introduce you to Erika uh, Zuraski. Um, she's a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She also so she she studied so, studied sociology, but also uh, she has a legal background. She also the uh, JD University of Wisconsin Law School. And uh, please, Erica, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that your research field moved a little bit from international environmental studies to critical food studies and legal geography. And uh, I think that today she will inspire us by presenting a research project on, on food deserts. So I would say, please, Erica, the floor is yours and take your time and uh, we'll be more than happy to then discuss and have a chat with you at the end of the presentation. And thank you very much for our um, invitation. Thank you, Mirta, and thank you, Chiara. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, thank you for sharing this space with me. Um, I'm very excited to share this work. Uh, it's I'm a fifth year PhD candidate, as as Mirta said, and so um, this is some of the first time I've been able to actually share my own research um, kind of outside the confines of the University of California, Santa Cruz. So. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen and please let me know if I get cut off or if anything happens. Um, and hopefully that is working all right. Let me, can everyone see my screen all right? Beautiful. Great. Um, so as Mirta said, technically I have my law degree from the University of Wisconsin. Um, I actually took quite a big break um, from thinking about law and the legal realm as I um, participated in a food justice nonprofit, um, which actually became the inspiration for my dissertation, dissertation research. Um, and so while I'm technically getting my PhD in sociology, I am also heavily influenced um, by my advisors who happen to be uh, critical food studies scholars and human geographers. So I like to dabble in a lot of different disciplines. Um, and what I want to offer today um, is a piece of my dissertation research, which I think will be most aligned with your own interests. Um, and to give you a picture of where I'm headed, I'm gonna talk about my overall dissertation project, but I also find it essential to give ample background on the food desert concept itself, because it has a very particular importance in the United States. 
Um, and so I also want to introduce kind of the scholarship that emerged in response to this concept. Um, and so then um, I'll get into kind of the theoretical frameworks that inform my work and then really dig into my own research. Um, but I want to also make ample space for any questions and conversations that we could potentially have because um, I'm sure at some point I'll get sick of myself uh, hearing myself talk. So um, without further ado, let me dive in. Um, so my dissertation broadly troubles and investigates the food desert concept. Uh, it attempts to understand its origins and how it became defined as uh, limited access to supermarkets and grocery stores, when it really could have meant so many different things. Um, as I'll explain in deeper detail, my research has demonstrated that there are actually a lot of projects beyond just building grocery stores that are undertaken in the name of uh, fixing food deserts. So my dissertation tries to demonstrate that the food desert concept invites projects like uh, gentrification, environmental degradation, neoliberal urban greening projects. Um, and as such, my research engages this uh, three-part analysis. First, questioning the origins of this concept, how they might explain how it got framed in such a way, um, second, I create and think about a taxonomy of food desert improvement projects. Um, so these are um, the types of projects undertaken, again, in the name of fixing food deserts. And so this concept draws heavily on critical development studies and Tanya Murray Lee's uh, book, Will, The Will to Improve. Um, and then finally, I zoom out, um, or I zoom in actually, into two very particular projects. Uh, one in Denver, Colorado, and one in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is where I am now. And the point of this is to understand how these types of projects are arrived at, what actors and institutions are kind of at the helm of these projects, and how do they foreclose other maybe more activist or community-led projects. Um, so from this an analysis, I hypothesize, and I think that despite all of these different uh, trajectories that food desert improvement projects can take, they're actually unified in their prioritization of capital development rather than meaningful food access. And I think that's quite important when we talk about food justice and food access issues. Um, so today I'm going to focus specifically on this kind of first part of my dissertation work. Um, focusing on U.S. policy, its role in kind of reproducing this limited frame of food deserts, and what kind of projects uh, U.S. policy kind of imagines and enacts in the name of fixing food deserts. But before I go too far afield into my own work, uh, I really want to lay some groundwork and identify dominant definitions of food deserts, and again, its significance in the United States. So generally, colloquially in the United States, um, a food desert refers to an area lacking in access to healthy and affordable food. Now that is a very broad definition. Um, and despite this really broad definition, the USDA, the US uh, Department of Agriculture, defines and uses geographic measures um, to conceptualize and kind of refine this concept. And so it becomes geographic distance from supermarkets and grocery stores to the exclusion of non-corporate, non-food retail, um, non retail. You could think like community gardens, backyard gardens. Um, and so the USDA uses distance as one measure, so miles to supermarkets uh, and low income as another. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate that this is, excludes community gardens, food banks, nonprofits, bodegas and corner stores, and other places that actually make up food landscapes that residents navigate. Um, and so the concept was, and in some instances it still is, a really important intervention away from what the um, 
what Robert Crawford called the new health consciousness in the United States in the mid 1970s. Um, and so Robert Crawford uh, noticed this kind of shift called uh, what he says is healthism, which is uh, something my advisor, Julie Guthman, talks about at length in her book, Weighing In, um, which I highly recommend. Um, but it's this moralization of health where individual responsibility is, you know, the key to good and proper health. Um, and so in this way, the food desert concept was an important turn away from this individualizing blame um, and more towards pervasive questions of access around what kind of systems structure food access. Um, and so there was this potential for this concept to do a lot of work and arguably it does. For example, in 2010, um, First Lady Michelle Obama unveiled her Let's Move campaign, introducing the food desert concept to the United States. And this really put the food desert concept in the national spotlight. Um, and Michelle Obama pledged uh, a modest $400 million a year to quote, eliminate food deserts in America completely in seven years. Um, and so this was going to be done through the Healthy Food Financing Initiative and Farmers Market Program, um, which was then codified um, in the Farm Bill. But these programs, you know, really brought a lot of awareness and support for community-based health issues. But they notably prioritized economic development and neighborhood revitalization through grocery stores and food retail. So all of this funding, this $400 million a year, was earmarked exclusively to develop grocery stores and farmer markets. Um, again, all supply side market oriented solutions. And, you know, since the seven years has lapsed, um, despite the total uh, pledged $3 billion to eliminate food deserts, Food inequity in the United States is still a really big issue, long past this 2017 deadline. Um, interestingly, what came along with uh, Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign is uh, what the USDA unveiled as the food desert locator map. So this is a multi-layered interactive map that allows users to toggle between local neighborhoods, entire regions and countries um, to view all of the food deserts dappling uh, the United States, which as you can see, there's quite a lot. Um, Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, who I'll note is once again, Secretary of Ag under President Joe Biden, uh, actually released this new USDA tool stating that they would quote, identify communities where public private partnerships and interventions can help make fresh, healthy, and affordable food more available. And so as the USDA's Atlas and Food Desert Locator map demonstrate, this concept went from metaphor and became spatialized through mapping initiatives. Um, and this did really help foster and push to get healthy food access on the radar of organizations and activists and policymakers. Um, because this was such a useful tool in part. Um, and just to kind of show off what this map can do, I'll take us to Santa Cruz, which is where I'm, I had the pleasure of meeting Mirta. Um, and you'll notice um, one of these greens, I think you can see my mouse. This is actually the University of California, Santa Cruz, which is marked as a food desert. Um, and so you can see kind of how this map works. You can zoom in on census tracts. I find it very interesting that an entire university is in fact mapped as a food desert. So quite a big distance from grocery stores and marked as a low income community. Um, so as the food desert concept became increasingly relied upon um, to really be the main descriptor of food inequity, Critical scholarship also emerged in outlining the dominant problems um, with this concept as the USDA used it. So this is a wide body of literature. I'm gonna try and give you the, the preview of this to get a sense of why this concept bothers me so much such that I, I write my entire dissertation about it. Um, 
But I'm happy to provide a works cited or a bibliography if folks are interested in, in reading more. Um, notably, a majority of this literature speaks to and kind of calls out the centrality of lack undergirding the concept, right? A food desert is what it lacks. It lacks grocery stores and supermarkets. So this is a deficit-centered framework and food desert maps actually demarcate landscapes and places as devoid of healthy food resources. So as a result, this dominant use overemphasizes supply side deficiencies while only quantifying access through corporate food retail. Uh, and framing this problem as a supply side deficiency, you completely lose out on an analysis of supply and demand as relational, right? And you also miss out on the way that uh, systems and kind of system systemic problems structure um, food retail landscapes to begin with, right? And so in essence, it falsely puts forth this, if you build it, they will come mentality which as I'll talk about later has um, really been troubled in critical, in critical scholarship. So critiques of supply side approaches also note a failure to actually shift public health conversations away from individual responsibility. So again, this notion of, of healthism, and it actually invited a neoliberal prescription of individual choice, personal responsibility, and um, education-based solutions that locate problems in um, knowledges of low-income communities, right? It takes up this narrative of people don't know what to eat. They don't know how to cook for themselves. While again, completely missing out on the ways that race and class and gender structure the landscapes that these people are living within. And so again, this blames victims of underdevelopment rather than supporting their coping strategies or preferred ways of living and eating. Um, so again, this kind of what I call pathologization of communities and places is also critiqued as kind of reproducing and normalizing a very particular type of landscape, which scholars have noted um, is predominantly white middle class. So a place that is not a food desert is seen as healthy, um, has you know sufficient food to support, but this is a moral kind of um, stance on what constitutes a healthy food landscape. So the pathologization of supposed unhealthy environments actually positions food deserts as a cause for obesity. Again, oversimplifying any analysis of how individuals navigate their own food geographies that are structured by broader processes of class and race formation. Um, and I'll note that the problem, by framing the problem of food deserts as a supply side deficiency, this actually translates into the solutions that are prescribed to fix food deserts. Um, you'll hear in the United States a lot, uh, we need to turn the food desert into a food oasis or a food forest. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of like impetus and demand to fix this problem. But again, the solution is limited to economic development by building grocery stores and supermarkets. Um, and so more recent scholarship has shown how food deserts tend to invite uh, gentrification, displacement of low income and communities of color um, to prioritize these white middle class food solutions. Um, usually Whole Foods is kind of the poster child for this type of displacement and gentrification. And so it's with all of these critiques in mind um, that I approach my investigation of the food desert um, and my research I see aligning with uh, activists and community demands to move away from this concept and use more adequate descriptors of food and equity. So um, activists is off, have offered this concept of food apartheid, which attends to the structural and racialized processes that create food inequity. So it actually attends to a lot of the critiques and pitfalls of the food desert concept 
while staying attentive to the things that cause inequitable food distribution, um, while at the same time still holding on to systemic anti-Blackness, which is quite pervasive in the United States and has structured a lot of geographies and places in the United States. But it, it's interesting because food apartheid has yet to fully replace this concept in media, popular discourse, and even scholarly writing, despite these demands, even from um, so many activists and community workers and the movement for Black Lives. So I see my research as centering activist demands to use food apartheid. And I do so by asking, why does US policy and proposed legislation continue to use the food desert concept? And how do these linguistic discursive choices actually matter for food justice efforts? So at this point, this is where I transition to my own research. Um, and as I stated before, I'm gonna be addressing one component of my dissertation that looks to examine uh, US legislation that uses this concept, the food desert concept. So I pull together quite a few disciplines to do so. Um, I like, as I said at, at the beginning of, of my talk, um, I like to dabble in many different fields. Um, so I invoke critical food studies, which we were just talking about, um, but I also bring in urban sociology and legal geographies, specifically on the production of space, um, while also drawing in critical development studies. So, this most recent chapter introduces a, a legal geographic analytic to the food desert concept. Um, I'm most interested lately in uh, most recent legislation of the Healthy Food Access for All Americans Act, which has only been briefly discussed uh, in the literature. So there really is an opportunity to examine it alongside a broader history of legislative proposals that invoke this concept um, to try and grapple with the legal and spatial imaginaries that are threaded throughout. And I would like to think that bringing legal geographies to the food desert offers an opportunity to investigate the contingencies and the constraints of spatial food justice and injustice. So seeing the food desert as a place where space, law, and injustice are actually co-produced um, and I think this is especially apropos with so much proposed legislation having not actually made it into codified law. Um, and with the 2023 Farm Bill discussions underway, there's a lot of potential for some of these proposals to actually become codified law and have very real material impacts. Um, so I think that bringing legal spatial theory to food deserts uh, offers these three um, very particular contributions. So specific to the food desert concept, I think that overall, um, we can see how the food desert concept moves from a metaphorical descriptor to an actual co-constitutor of the reproduction of inequitable food landscapes. Now that is quite a sentence and there's a lot to unpack here. Um, so I want to go quite slow through each contribution and be sure that I also offer some groundwork on what I mean by production of space and legal geographies. Um, so I'm going to briefly discuss these this kind of analysis as an umbrella and then I'll go into each one in detail. Um, so first it's through Henri Lefebvre's notion of abstract space um, which again, I will discuss, uh, but we can see how the food desert concept as a metaphor then becomes material, materially meaningful and spatially represented. This then draws attention to the very institutions and actors that contribute to this type of representation. Um, and so I attend here in part two uh, to US legal institutions. And then finally, by teasing out how space is produced, how the food desert concept is kind of writ onto space, this creates what I think is ample opportunity to kind of disrupt this construction, to replace it with a different representation 
say, uh, food apartheid that doesn't have as big of a role in reproducing uh, food injustices. So again, before I launch into my own analysis, I want to give a little bit of background on Henri Lefebvre's production of space. Um, I do find it to be quite niche, quite complicated and very abstract. So I'm gonna try and simplify it without um, doing any dishonor to Henri Lefebvre. Um, but it is such a fundamental part of my analysis. So the production of space was introduced by Henri Lefebvre in 1974. Um, in his book of the same name. And so what this theory does is offers a unitary theory of space, weaving together physical, mental, and social. And so this confronts directly a notion of space as an empty container within which we live, right? It's not just a theater upon which the social is enacted. Um, instead, we see how Space is social and the social is in space. Um, importantly, this really draws attention to how humans produce and reproduce space and how uh, both are kind of impacted by each other. And so in effect, this is both abstract and concrete. And I think this um, triad that I have on, on my slides is really helpful in trying to understand and unpack what Henri Lefebvre means. So you see that space is not only physical, but it's mental and also lived. So the physical element, the spatial practice, is the material space that we move through every day. Very material, very physical. For Henri Lefebvre, there's also the conceived and the mental. So how we imagine space to be. Um, for Lefebvre, this is the realm of scientists and planners and architects, like how we imagine space. Um, and then also the lived is um, seen as like the everyday space. Um, and so it's through this kind of imbrication um, space as social and mental and also lived that you begin to see how metaphor, abstraction, symbolic meaning actually help produce our built environments and influence planning. Interestingly, um, one thing that's really fundamental to Lefebvre's analysis is investigating how space is deployed in the service of power. And so one avenue is what he calls abstract space. And this is space which is put to the service of an abstract purpose. So thinking about like space used for capital development or city planning. Um, some of the examples that Lefebvre gives or other um, urban geographers give is thinking about census tracts or thinking about subdivisions um, in the suburbs. So this division of space is actually an abstraction that gets writ onto physical landscapes. Um, Lefebvre notes that there are three tendencies that characterize abstract space. Uh, these are important, I'll come back to these um, later. It's fragmentation, homogeneity, and hierarchy. And so more recent scholarship, and here I'm thinking with Chris Butler, provides an example of the state's role in the production of abstract space. So he uses land use zoning um, as a very particular example. And these abstractions um, manifest originally discursively through the use of spatial language. And so you can think of metaphors like the food desert. And this provides an entryway to think about how language is so useful in the production of space. Now, I also draw in quite a bit of legal geographies to understand the role that law and geography have in the production of space. So this brings an important focus to how law actually has a role in configuring space, um, and therefore how law and space have a relational role in justice and injustice. So similar to um, the production of space, this moves beyond the mere fact of law as an institution to actually investigate how law makes space and space makes law. 
I think a very ready example of this is thinking about the use of borders, both spatially and legally. Um, this also tends to confront a representation of law as apolitical or natural or anti-geographical. Especially in the United States, um, American law is often constructed as a set of abstract, acontextual, ahistorical statements. And while law tries to represent itself as this um, conduit through which facts speak, the reality is, is it, it constitutes an evolving and contested world of possibilities. Um, there's actually quite a few legal interpretations, but law actually selects a singular reading of law, uh, thereby excluding other possibilities. And again, I am speaking quite particularly to the United States here. Um, and so despite its best efforts to maintain an air of objectivity, law actually has to be understood as a normative instrument with a moral dimension. Um, and so for critical legal geographies, this is um, what needs to be analyzed. And I find these two bodies of literature to be quite um, copacetic in that geographies confronts a notion of space as a mere backdrop to social action and legal geographies confronts a notion that law is purely in the realm of discourse. Um, and so instead we see together how law configures space in ways that has a material impact. And so if we are to take seriously how law configures space, and can configure space through discursive ideological representations, then I ask, what does this mean for how law uses the food desert concept? Um, and so drawing on Lefebvre's notion of abstract space, I actually argue that the food desert concept uh, is an abstraction of space used for capital development. Um, and I start with how the USDA maps and quantifies the concept. Um, again, as Lefebvre noted, abstract space is characterized by um, tendencies towards fragmentation, homogeneity, and hierarchy that all work together to further capitalist development. So I turn to the USDA's um, food desert locator map. Again, this map was a product of um, the Obama era 2008 Farm Bill, which mandated a report on food deserts, um, including the incidence and prevalence of food deserts, its characteristics, its effects. Um, and so the resulting study that, that came from this 2008 Farm Bill uh, also created the USDA food desert locator map, which has become a dominant representation of food deserts in the United States, underpinning legislative proposals um, and pretty much dominant discourses even in media. So to note, the USDA has actually significantly refined the definition of a food desert um, from this 2008 Farm Bill definition, definition, which more generally referred to limited food access. And this map in the USDA made it mappable, quantifiable, and measurable. So it's in this instance that the USDA, redefining and sophisticating the definition of a food desert, you see it come to mean low-income census tracts with a substantial number or share of residents with low levels of access to retail outlets selling healthy and affordable foods. So I want to slow down and trace these instances of fragmentation, homogenization, and hierarchy that Lefebvre says are characteristic of abstracted space. Um, so first, we see fragmentation. Uh, the USDA relies on census tracts as the baseline container to map and measure food deserts. So census tracts in the United States are permanent subdivisions of counties and they aim to have a standard number of people. Um, on this slide, you can see on the left, you can see a kind of mapping of census tracts. They get bigger in more rural areas, more concentrated in urban areas. 
Um, so this is the fragmentation aspect of abstract space. Then the USDA places qualifiers within census tracts to determine if it is a food desert or not. Um, these measures consist of poverty rate and low access, speaking of distance to grocery stores and supermarkets. Um, so to be considered low access, census tracts must have, quote, at least 500 persons and or 33% of the population living more than one mile from a supermarket or large grocery store, or 10 miles in the case of a rural census tract. Of note, as many have criticized, this measure only includes supermarkets and large grocery stores. Uh, thus, again, we see the simplification, uh, this kind of homogenization of what a food landscape looks like. Um, interestingly, again, this homogenization only makes corporate food retail legible. And finally, we have hierarchy, so the hierarchizing of space. Lefebvre uses the example of center and periphery, explaining um, how center tends to organize that which around it is around it um, as a kind of hierarchizing principle. So the USDA's hierarchy is just as simple, I think. Either a census tract is a food desert or it is not. Um, now, there certainly are differing degrees, whether it's uh, one mile to a supermarket, 10 miles to a supermarket. Um, so yes, there is an, a way in which severity of a food desert can be captured. However, this hierarchizing logic still applies. Census tract is either a food desert or it isn't. They're identified as a problem to be fixed as an unhealthy landscape in need of improvement. So. I argue simply that the USDA takes this food desert metaphor and uses it to quantify and map places, which I argue is in the service of capital development, not necessarily food access. Um, and so this is where my concept of food desert improvement projects becomes especially important to substantiate this point. Um, and here is where the legal geographic analytic brings attention to the constellation of practices and actors that actually construct and reproduce this very specific uh, abstraction of food deserts. Um, so the USDA's metaphor and definition of a food desert would likely be quite uneventful if it didn't become the dominant conceptualization that now underwrites laws and legislative proposals. So it's here that I see the USDA's mapping and quantification become legally and spatially meaningful and thus become a political instrument deployed to continually structure space. So I argue that uh, U.S. proposed legislation demonstrates food desert improvement projects and how they serve abstract space for capital development. So these policies actually imagine a space in need of improvement and thus in, new, in need of a particular type of capital development. So in this sense, this legislation is complicit in uh, the production of uneven and inequitable food landscapes. So I take these proposals as evidence of how legal institutions use the food desert concept in the name of capital development. So here in this part of my analysis, I looked at 15 unique legislative proposals. Many of these have been reintroduced as you can see across different years. Um, and so I conducted a content analysis of these proposals, noting first the definition of a food desert that they used, and the proposed solution that they offered. So the proposed solution being my concept of a food desert improvement project. Of all 15 proposals, um, and again, note that some of these have been reintroduced many times across multiple years, 57% um, rely on the USDA's food desert definition. Another 28.5% use the 2008 Farm Bill definition of which the USDA refined and built on. So I take this as very strong evidence of the US uh, legal system's use of 
the abstracted food desert concept, again, this fragmented, homogenized, and hierarchized concept. The question then becomes, to what end is this definition used? Um, it's through, again, this concept of food desert improvement projects that we can see the material and spatial significance of this abstraction. So you see how re representing food deserts in a particular way informs the projects that are proposed and enacted to fix the problem. Um, so my analysis and coding of these projects shows that 50% of these acts propose grocery store development, rehabilitation, or funding as the improvement. Um, some acts propose more than one solution. For example, the Fit for Life Act offers grocery store rehabilitation, funding for a virtual farmer's market, grants for community gardens, uh, expansion of school luncheons and education programming. So really throwing everything um, at this particular definition of a food desert. But in total, overwhelmingly, 71% of these proposals prioritize supply side capital development projects. I find it exceptionally interesting, and I'm gonna turn back to a slide here. There are only, a very few of these proposals that have been codified into public law, one of them most recently being the National Defense and Authorization Act. So you might wonder, what is a food desert concept doing in national defense? Uh, it is actually in providing a stipend to military and armed service members, um, which is the only time I've ever seen a stipend or supplemental income as a solution to a food desert. And it is only for uh, military and armed services and their families. I find that personally quite fascinating. Um, but so again, let me get back to my notes here. Um, this kind of prioritization of supply side capital development projects is exceedingly ironic in light of studies that have continually proven that healthy food access, access to grocery stores, does not immediately translate into the purchase of the food at that stores, right? That altering a food environment actually does little in the United States to change food acquisition patterns, whether this be because of um, low income, low wages, high cost of living, high cost of the products offered in these stores, to continually offer supply side capital development through grocery stores does not really remedy the issue of inequitable food access in the United States. So these legislative representations drawing on the USDA's definition are far from just benign discursive choices, but instead through this concept of food desert improvement projects, these representations manifest onto food landscapes as supply side development, right? And so if these corporate food retail projects do little to enact meaningful change and meaningful access, uh, then what does this tell us about the US uh, legal system's role in the reproduction of inequitable food access? So I would be remiss if I ended my analysis there, and I believe Henri Lefebvre would come haunt me from his grave if I did, because it's not just that space is a pure site of domination, but it's a terrain of struggle. Uh, Lefebvre famously states that there is a politics of space because space is political, which means that when we attend to the processes that inform the production of space, we see what's also possible, what is left out, what is not included in that production of space and legal processes are part of that process. Um, so this attention to process means attention to the contingency of the results. So it's my hope that by attending to the very specific nuances of this food desert concept, how it's made legally and spatially significant also makes space to contest this representation in legal spaces especially. So from this vantage point, um, I argue that the United States legal system plays a significant role in the food desert concepts, materialization and spatialization. 
And yes, the U.S. legislation may underwrite the role that the food desert concept plays in reproducing inequitable food landscapes. But I hope to draw on these longstanding critiques of the food desert concept to actually make space for spatial justice, uh, remedying of food apartheid and food justice and food sovereignty. Um, I think it's important to note that this representation, you know, brings into question what justice might mean in a system where law has a hand in reproducing food and justice. And we can ask in what way does the US legal system constrain food justice, or better yet, how might it more directly enact food justice if we have this kind of representation of space in mind? So again, I hope this opens up space for contestation. There are so many activists and community defined descriptors of food inequity like food apartheid, um, but there isn't a single legislative proposal or law that references food apartheid. So I do think there is ample room um, to disrupt and contest this kind of continued use of the food desert concept and replace it with more activist led, community driven voices. Um, that really have a much more trenchant and sophisticated critique um, and ways of envisioning otherwise. Um, again, I do think this is especially important in light of what's on the horizon in the United States, specifically the 2023 uh, Farm Bill, which um, is still under kind of debate and consideration. There's a lot of conversations happening around that. Um, but also a recent announcement by President Joe Biden for a White House conference on hunger and nutrition. Um, this is the first time such a conference has been held since 1969, so in more than 50 years. And the last time this conference was held, um, an extreme amount of food assistance programs and recommenda recommendations were implemented including uh, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or um, what was formerly known as food stamps in the United States. So all of this is to say, I find it extremely important to attend to the role um, that the US legal system has in the production of space, and specifically how the US legal system underwrites the making and remaking of uneven and inequitable food landscapes. Um, so this is all that I've prepared to, to chat on today, but at this point, I've said space and food desert and representation so many times, I'm a bit sick of hearing myself speak, and I'm more excited to engage in conversation uh, with all of you. Um, and I'm happy to share my slides. Again, I said um, I would be willing to share my work cited or my bibliography. I'm more than happy to do that. But thank you all. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erika. Uh, that was really inspiring, I would say that. So I have a lot of questions, but actually I see a lot of uh, nodding faces. So if somebody else wants to uh, start. Or otherwise, I will start with my questions. OK, OK, great. Um, so that's I actually had the pleasure to read the paper that she's writing about this. Um, uh, concept. So uh, I took advantage of that, and I would just, I would I just want to share some some comments uh, because first of all I was so surprised to see how the concept of food desert uh, was actually um, it identified in the uh, in Scotland. So I would say in the European region, but then became became uh, became much um, a much more mainstream I would say concept in the United States to to such an extent that has been legally defined. Uh, and please tell me if I'm wrong in the 2008 farm bill, right? So that's really interesting because also on the one end, I, uh, I'm usually a very fan of legal definition. <laughs> so um, actually your, uh, your presentation also made me think about, okay, perhaps sometimes legal definition could serve as a safety net. This is how I see legal definition, but as perhaps you showed us, they could also create some uh, distortion of, of reality. So my, my 
my first question is, um, I don't know, what, what do you see at the intersection between this top-down approach so of the law and then the, the, the bottom-up approach, the, so the society, uh, social movements? Because I think that society uh, plays a big role here, right? Because it seems that uh, the legal definition, which, and this is my understanding of your presentation and your paper, so the legal definition is actually shaping uh, a, um, um, it's mapping a place, but also shaping and deciding on whether a place could be defined and identified as a food desert or, or the food desert or or not. So, my question is: So, what what do you see at the intersection of this top down and and, and bottom up approach? And um, do you also think that the law can play a positive role in uh, on that? So, instead of ends up being a would say an instrument of discrimination. What are what are your thoughts on that? Those are great questions, and I really yeah. appreciate them. Um, the first, I think, U.S. law and policy plays only one role in what types of projects actually manifest. So, when I was giving the bigger picture of my dissertation, I end with field sites to really examine what actors on the ground are involved in what projects get enacted. So I do think that policy uh, plays a very particular role, especially when it comes to funding and tax grants um, and grants writ large, um, but it's actors on the ground, whether it's developers, local politicians, communities that really enact this kind of terrain of struggle that I was talking about. How does one project get chosen over another? Who informs that decision? Um, what is the realm of possibilities that propose, are proposed and whose voices get left out? So I still have much more work to do in that sense, but um, based on my research, it does seem like, you know, you can trace the line from US policy to the project as it's enacted in place. Um, again, always prioritizing capital development, to the exclusion of meaningful food access. Um, and then to answer your second question, I don't know if I've landed on an answer of hope or faith in the US legal system just because it is quite fraught. Um, I think the US legal institution is a very unique and particular beast. Um, and I think the way that the U.S. legal system might be structured may constrain what type of justice can be enacted. Um, so thinking about if food is a human right, how do you take that right to court, right? How do you get that right to food in the United States? How do you um, contest redlining as a way that has structured your food environment so dramatically that there isn't a grocery store within 10 miles? So I do think if the U.S. legal system included concepts like food apartheid in policies and legislative acts, then that's a different conversation. But I just don't know when that will happen. And maybe maybe my research will encourage that, hopefully. And that's kind of the hope. Thank you. Um, oh, I don't know who, who was first. <laughs> Edwin. Yeah, Edwin also. Okay, please. Cool. Thanks, Mita. And thank you, Erica, for your uh, fascinating presentation. Really interesting stuff. And um, I was just, you know, kind of triggered by the whole the desert idea because you approach it quite conceptually. And then, uh, you know, some friends or farmers in the West here in, uh, in the Netherlands send me photos of their actual deserts now because we haven't had rain in weeks. And, uh, you know, that's the third drought in uh, three or four years. Uh, that's threatening harvest, etc. And I was just wondering if you could, you know, what the climate dimension means for for the struggles that you already see in this domain and how it affects this, or if you have any ideas on, I don't know, what what kind of uh, dynamics this this might cause there. Yeah, I love that question. Um, actually, my master's thesis I wrote on kind of the use of the desert in the food desert concept and what types of imaginaries are kind of writ into that concept. Um, and 
it's important, I think, to kind of parse out that history, like what sort of imaginaries, what desert do you imagine when you hear a food desert? It's a very like comical kind of stereotypical desert. And so I actually argue that this is a colonial imaginary of a desert, which automatically says a desert is a place that can't sustain life, is inherently unproductive to capitalism. You know, you can kind of build out this narrative. And I think holding on to that while also recognizing that real desertification, aridification, and environmental issues are really prominent and going to be a bigger and bigger problem as climate change happens to kind of move away from easy metaphors that have this colonial um, imperialist history to then attend to like, this is actually where there has been a drought for five to 10 years and we're seeing loss of farmland, we're seeing increased in wildfires. So I think, I hope I'm answering your question is, is to attend more to the reality of desertification, climate change, aridification, and not use simplistic metaphors where there actually aren't deserts but you're using this kind of imagined um, metaphorical with um, metaphorical um, image that draws on very odd narratives of deserts. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, can I maybe just add one small, super small thing? Because, um, I, yeah, I don't know. I just feel that in the presentation, it's so much about the social and the power relations, and I just... I'm very interested how this, you know, the pressure from climate change, how that will further impact and maybe worsen those power relations and uh, how food is, you know, food is a human right, but it's not only threatened by economic powers, but also by climate change, making it much more difficult to access food and water. I don't know. I just find that a very uh, interesting and scary dynamic. Um, so that was, I don't know, but I also really liked and uh, found your answer very interesting. So thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I almost wonder if food apartheid would be a concept that actually attends to what you're talking about, whereas a food desert makes it seem like it's just this landscape that's always existed in this way. So you could complicate an analysis to include climate change to see how the impacts of climate change um, disproportionately are felt by different communities um, in different places. So that's uh, something for me to think about. I appreciate it. Please, Anna. Yes, hello. I'm Hanna Shibesa from the Law Group as well. And um, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed um, yeah, the conceptualization of your argument and this uh, foundation in sociology that you found with Lefebvre. I think you really did a really interesting um, job to, to create a quite solid foundation for your argument and your critique. So I, I really enjoyed that. I haven't seen it in a long time, I think. Um, that somebody really commits to an approach and, and applies it like that. Um, so I think I just have a question that is, well, so you formulated your critique in, in quite an amazing way. And the question is, can you also then use it to formulate a way of constructing an alternative reality? And where would that lead you? Um, because at the moment, the critique is very strong, but perhaps the construction of a better world, as it were, um, you know, can you use the same model? Will you use a spatial model? And perhaps it does link a little bit to this question about where is the environment in there. I also wonder, um, in your answer, perhaps at first instance you could look at space, but then I also wonder what's the individual's role in space there, right? So, yeah, I would just um, be curious to hear your uh, thoughts on that. And... Um, yeah, I have a smaller uh, question later, but maybe you could answer this one first. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate your question. There's, so Henri Lefebvre also talks about the right to the city. Um, that's kind of the way that he sees contestation to power structures and dominant ways that space is used. So there's a lot of legal geographic um, work on the right to the city less on the production of space. So I think in the kind of broader trajectory of my dissertation, attending to 
um, local communities, how they can re-represent space in a way that might be more equitable or actually enact projects that bring food um, into communities. Um, that's kind of where my dissertation will end with this, the field site analysis, looking at individuals um, with, again, hopes to kind of bring community voices to the end, end narrative of my dissertation. I do think in the United States, especially, there's so much organizing and so much activist work that's already being done in communities. It's just not making its way to the policy level. So maybe that's another space for, for analysis is like, how do you take the lived realities, the way that residents navigate their spaces and translate that into policy or projects? Um, when it comes to food justice and food sovereignty. So I think when I think of, you know, activism that's been done, has been done for a really long time, I think about the Black Panther Free Breakfast Program, which um, inspired the National School Lunch Program. So there already are these ways of thinking about otherwise and acting otherwise. It's just now what is the kind of relationship between law and those efforts? when it comes to food policy. Yeah, and do you think that there is a way of conceptualizing food deserts in a way that might be um, more equitable perhaps, or more socially just according, um, you know, to your views? Because it is a very powerful concept and perhaps um, by discarding it altogether, uh, you do sort of take away that motion behind it. So I just wonder in how far you see there is some potential to the concept at all or, or not. I personally, I think we can move on from the concept and see what food apartheid would do. But I think a redefinition of, of a food desert might move away from this kind of particular abstraction of space that Lefebvre talks about. Um, so as the USDA defines the food desert, I take particular issue with how that definition gets used to invite particular development projects. So I, I also think it's important, as I said in my presentation, to hold on to the positive work that that concept has done in bringing awareness, in bringing funding to nonprofits and community organizations. You can't just um, lose that history and kind of that acknowledgement when I when I launch my critique. So yeah, it's I think it's a question that has been quite per pervasive in scholar in scholarship is like what to do with this concept now that it's been critiqued up and down. Um, and I think again, I kind of take my step forward from activists and community organizers and people who experience food and access and injustice. So yeah. Thank you. So I would say uh, Silvia first, right? Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I really liked it and really appreciated it. And I was wondering how, for example, the nutritional values of considered and measured in relation to the food desert maps. If there is a way of like measuring also the nutritional value of the food products, then in those places, even though they don't look like as food deserts, but maybe they are from another perspective. And if this part is included or could be included, yeah, that's a that's a great question. There is no measure for nutritional value in the food desert maps. So it's either has a grocery store or a supermarket or it doesn't. Um, there's no kind of measure of what's offered at that grocery store. Um, how many fruits and vegetables on a daily basis are sold at that at that kind of location. So it's very much a problem. Um, and the studies that do try and kind of map nutritional value onto food deserts continue to use this kind of underlying definition and mapping scheme by the USDA. 
So with all of these kind of critiques of the concept, how it's mobilized by the USDA to then use that in a study of nutritional value of stores, there are still some problems that that kind of translate. Um, I will say that there is another concept that is not as prominent, but is floating around called a food swamp that again, has a very morally charged character to it. And it's used to describe food landscapes that have only unhealthy food. So fast food corner stores, again, this completely invisibilizes that McDonald's sells apples and milk and water, that there is, you know, healthy food and celery sticks in fast food restaurants. Um, but it assumes that residents are just buying, you know, unhealthy food. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chiara, it's your turn. Hi, and thank you very much, Erika. I really enjoyed your presentation. I think it will be very interesting also for, for our students who will later watch the video. Um, I would like to ask you, first of all, uh, to what extent does the concept of uh, human right to food enter this debate, given that the federal government of the U.S. has not ratified uh, the international instruments that uh, uh, sanction, that recognize the right to food as a human right, uh, such as the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, or even the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child? Um, so to what extent uh, is this dimension enshrined in this debate? Because this international law notion of the right to food would actually require an intervention on the demand side as well, eliminating discrimination, providing food uh, to those who cannot uh, provide for, for themselves. Um, and uh, secondly, what is the interaction, if any, in this debate between the federal level and the state level, because uh, of course the USDA is um, using this notion of food desert, deserts and it's also responsible for programs like the SNAP program or, or the so-called food stamps, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But at the same time at the state level, uh, as far as I know, the states have the competence to adopt certain taxation laws, for instance, to tax uh, sugary drinks or unhealthy foods. So what is the, the possible, the potential interaction between the two levels of government in uh, uh, addressing uh, the issue of food, of food desert, perhaps also going beyond uh, this uh, restrictive notion or distortive notion of uh, uh, food deserts? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Chiara. I Really, really love those questions. The first, um, thinking about food as a human right in the United States, um, it seems to be a discussion, if it is being had, is one separate from the food desert kind of critique and, and realm. Um, I don't often see, especially in legislation or law, any reference of food as a right much less a human right, that tends to happen much more at the activist level, like nonprofits using this phrase, food is a right, not a privilege. Um, and I really don't see food as a human right taking place, you know, with politicians very often. I don't want to say never, but it isn't something um, that I see too readily. Um, I will say there's a lot of skepticism by communities, especially communities of color, indigenous communities and black communities of the legal system in the United States for obvious reasons. Um, for indigenous communities, um, their right to land and sovereignty has been stripped without any kind of uh, avenue towards reparations or getting land back, right? And so um, there is a lot of skepticism about what the US legal system can and will do to enforce rights. Um, and I think your second question, the, the interaction of federal and state is likewise important. Um, and I want to kind of zoom out and take into context the history of neoliberalism in the United States, how a lot of these rollback social programs required um, the emergence of, 
you know, nonprofits, food pantries, kind of in the shadow of where the state used to um, used to fund. And that's still very much felt. Uh, nonprofits in the United States rely so heavily on external funding and grants, a lot of them from, you know, federal funding. Um, so there's that connection that down through um, down through the federal funding, you get state funding, which then gets doled out to communities and nonprofits and developers. Um, that being said, I do, so the second phase of my dissertation creates um, what I call a taxonomy of food desert improvement projects. So trying to understand all of the different projects enacted. And so that's at the kind of state and county level. I'll get a far better picture of that kind of interaction between federal and state. Uh, which I do think is really important. <clears throat> uh, Erica, there's a question for you in, in the chat. But Hannah, if you want to say something. Yeah, yeah no, I didn't know if we have time um, because it's more a curiosity than a sort of <laughs> deep questions. I wondered um, how did you do the coding in practical terms, you know, because, um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting to explore a bit the new legal methods um, that we have. And um, I just wondered if you use a specific program or, um, you know, like kind of manual coding or or how you did that. Yeah, so I developed a like coding scheme um, based off of that book, Will to Improve, Tanya Murray Lee. Um, she talks about these particular elements um, looking at the will to improve, like how is the problem framed? Who is considered the expert? Uh, what is the problem that the kind of solution enacted? So I have a framework to kind of set up my coding. Um, I use um, Devin Think as kind of organizing all of my materials because you have the legislative text, you have the different versions, you have kind of the committee meetings on each text. Um, so I use that to kind of convene all of the material and then in vivo to code. So I'm taking this framework, imposing it, but once I have the taxonomy of food desert improvement projects, I'm going to return and make sure I've accounted for everything. So kind of going back and recoding on that sense. So. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any other question from from the floor? I don't see any hands. Okay, raise hands. Okay, so I would say, Erika, thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much. We really appreciate your, I mean, like, uh, you 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 brought us into your world, and we always adopt a European perspective here in Wageningen because this is our you know like field of expertise also and field of interest. But I think that since sometimes it's really important also to uh, you know make a comparison to 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 see what it's happening because uh, then when I thought about inviting Erica, I remember my, my experience when I was in the United States being the, the only European students there in the classroom. And then I, <laughs> the, uh, and this is this is why I'm so, ha I'm so happy to have you here. And so uh, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I don't know, Erica, if you want to say something, but otherwise uh, enjoy the weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I just want to thank all of you for, for being here. Um, I know it was quite a slog through some dense theoretical forays, but I really appreciate your presence and patience. Um, and I hope maybe someday we can meet in person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're have a good way. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.